I'll be reading Ephesians chapter 4, verse 13 through 16. Until we all attain this to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the ways and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ, from who the whole body joined and to, held together by every joint with which it is equipped, which, which each part is working properly, makes the body grow so, grow so that it is built itself in love. Spring has sprung and the bell has rung for Christians all about. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin that so easily besets us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set on the right hand of the Almighty God. Hebrews 12, verses 1 and 2. Good morning, good morning. The Lord has blessed us with a beautiful day in order that we can worship him. Amen? And even when the days are cloudy and rainy, the S-O-N always shines. Let us keep those things in mind. And today, with, with all of the beautiful skies and the ability to get out and to see one another and to do more and more as we, we gather together as God's people, what a great blessing that is. But I must tell you that I am concerned. I'm concerned that we're living in a world where so many are unhappy. But the greater concern is unhappiness in the Lord's church, people who are redeemed, who seem to be unhappy. We, we spent an entire quarter studying from Brother Eric Owen's book titled, So You Want to Be Happy, and we discovered some fundamental things about being happy, and one of them is that physical things and the control and power over them, well, those those things won't bring us happiness. But those things that are spiritual, those things that we know that will be for e eternity, those things can bring us happiness from within. So why is it that some who were redeemed would seem to have faces that are frowning? <laughs> I wonder... If somewhere in, in the psyche of all of Christians, there is this pressure that, that, that I know that comes in, in our direction. And, and, and I understand that sometimes pressure can make us feel or, or make us uh, unhappy. And, and, you know, and I remember looking at pictures, by the way, of preachers in days gone by. You know, from the 40s and the 50s and even the 60s and the 70s. And there must have been some tradition among, among many of those men in the days gone by that photography was a very serious business. They, they didn't smile very much, but the ones who I've seen who were pictures, I've seen pictures of who were smiling were people who had done marvelous work in the Lord's kingdom, people who had taught one-on-one, -on -one. people who were indeed redeemed and happy about it not expecting themselves to have to be the Alexa of the Bible, not expecting themselves to have to be the Siri of the Bible, no, but those who are diligently studying from His Word on a regular basis, and the redeemed find joy in that. But I'm afraid that there would be some who would say, 
Well, Jeff, <clears throat> I was baptized for the remission of my sins back in 19, so that's over 20 years ago. And guess what I did? I read my Bible all the way through back in 2012. Fundamentally, what you're saying to me is, I've done everything I need to do, so I'm just going to wait. Would that explain why you're unhappy? You know, some, some of the waiting can be some of the most weary time that we can have in our lives. And if I ask the person who said, well, I read my Bible through in 2012, and I said, well, have you done it again lately? You know what I'll get? This sarcastic, angry, insulted look at me. Why, what do you mean? I already did my job. I read it through that time. But I'm afraid today that developing patterns like this has, has caused us to have some problems and, and such that we don't understand the principles that God has laid out for us in His Word. You see, go with me for a minute. Just go with me for a minute to a, um, a poorly lit room. There's paneling all around. You remember when the houses used to have paneling in them? Paneling all around this room. And you walk in this room and there's a, there's a smell of kind of antique furniture, you know, that kind of leathery kind of, I don't know how to explain it. When, when furniture's antique, you know what I'm talking about. When, when you walk in there and you, you smell this smell. And, and there in this dimly lit room is this, is this old man who's sitting in, by the way, a wooden office chair. You don't see those hardly anymore. A wooden office chair that squeaks. And he turns, and as you come in the room, he says, You know, <clears throat> I, uh, I learn something from this book every day. As he lays his Bible down on his desk. I've told you about that man before. His name, W.D. McPherson. And you know what he was saying to me? What he was saying to me fundamentally is, Jeff, Jeff, I just learned something today. The implication is, did you? Did you learn something today? I think that maybe... We have a problem with our patterns today, and our patterns are really the way that we act, the habits that we have. And, and today, we're going to focus on some, some pattern changes by using the principles that we'll find here in Ephesians chapter 4. And as we look at those patterns that we need to change based on the principles that we learn, we're going to find something that is absolutely amazing. There is a need that God has blessed us with to pursue in this life. Did you realize that? There is an innate desire in every soul to pursue something. And we've learned when we studied Brother Owen's book that, that physical things don't provide what we need because they're going to wear out. And, and by the way, there's only so much food you can eat, and there's only so much that I can eat, believe me, there, there really is. And, and there's, there are things wear out, and, and then, and then um, you know, then, then other things that we don't, having power and control, you know, that kind of fits along with what Maslow said we had in a hierarchy of needs, you know, fundamentally he would say that we need physiological support. And that's, that's food and that's, that's clothing and, and shelter and things of that nature. And then he said that we need uh, um, psychological support. And, and that really is nothing more than what he was talking about there is that we need to have um, our, our interactions and our place in the world round about us and our society in the world round about us. And then on the very top of his list, he put this self-actualization thing up there on the top, which when, when he said, well, you know, this is, this is a, a full support of potential. Someone is, is reaching their full potential when 
when they get up into this spot, we have a need to reach that thing, you know, and I, and I look at all those things and I think, well, you know, as we go through those things, the physical things of this world are not in my control. You know, I didn't control the fact that we ran out of gas last week. It wasn't in my control at all. And, and then, you know what else? When it comes to, to relationships with human beings, the relationships with human beings are not just dependent on me. They're dependent on others as well. So, so those things can get out of my control. And then this self-actualization thing on the very top, well, you know, it sounds to me an awful lot like pride comes before a fall, if you look at it principally speaking, if you, you ask me. And then so there's one thing that's missing from all of this. A diligent pursuit, a diligent need filled only by the mighty God. Have you ever thought about the fact that God is so big and so much that you can spend your lifetime learning about Him and still not know it all? You can, and now there are rewards that come from, from learning about Him. There, there, there is satisfaction in coming to, to grow closer to Him constantly as we, we grow our faith, but we can learn so much about Him and be involved in that pursuit. And in as much as we can't control the physical things of this life, we can't control how other people react and respond to us, but we can control how we walk in our faith and how we grow. Did you know that fundamentally, psychologists have discovered that the only thing that really will bring someone happiness is the feeling of growth. Some area in your life has to be growing. I mean, we know cars can break down, houses can be destroyed, our health can be set back after setback. But if we're feeling in some area of our life constantly that we are growing, we will find a sense of peace and have happiness in this life. So, so what is it from our text today that we can glean so that we can develop some new patterns and some new principles in order to be those who are happy? Growing our faith. Progress is essential for the Christian to remain faithful. And as we think about that and look at our text, I believe the first principle that we see there is unity. Till we all come to the unity, now watch this, of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. When we look in this verse, we see a lot of togethers. Together in faith, together in knowledge, together completing each other. The fundamental word here is together. Now I want to tell you something. Jim said something a minute ago that was absolutely what he was indicating. I'm just going to make it real plain for you. When we gather together for worship and for Bible study, and when you are here, you encourage others. You encourage others. When you are missing, you discourage others. Plain and simple. There it is. So think about this with me for a minute. If I want to take this idea, this principle of unity and develop a new pattern, then I'm going to determine that today, from this day forward, I will be an encourager. You can do that, amen? You can be an encourager. So this is something we can do today, is to decide to be encouragers. Do you believe in the one God of the Bible? Amen? Oh, my. Do you believe in the one God of the Bible? Do you believe what he says? Now this one is not for an answer out loud. If you believe in the one God of the Bible, and you believe what he says, are you living it? For some, the answer may have been a little bit confusing because the thing that clicked in your head was, well, I, 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 I think so. 
If you were getting ready to take a trip across the country, and this is your first time on a plane in, a, in over a year, and you get aboard and you speak to the pilot and you say, well, do, do you know how to fly this thing in a joking manner? And then he says, well, I think so. Would that be satisfactory? What about if the surgeon that was about to do your surgery, you asked, well, do you know how to do this heart catheterization? And he said, well, I think so. You know where I'm going. Is your faith riding on, I think so? If it is, there, friend, is some weak faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he that comes to God must believe that he is and is the rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Now you know when I get to that word, what am I going to do? Diligently seek him. I overpronounce that word every time I get there because of the point that I'm trying to make is that being a faithful Christian involves some motivational work. It involves some moving forward. It involves some study. It involves some attention to God's word. And you know, with all that we learn from God's Word, there is still more constantly. You know, no matter how many times you read this book through, you can't find all of Him. But the fun part is, every time you do, you learn something new. Are you reading your Bible every day? Are you? You know, Brother Jim Simpson celebrated this past week having read the New Testament 230 times. How about that? Now he'll say with a smile, the Old Testament, not so much. <laughs> the New Testament 230 times. Are you reading your Bible through every day? Put your name on the list. Be a daily Bible reader. Well, Jeff, it's already May. You know, this year's half gone. It doesn't matter as long as you are breathing. It is time to get started reading from God's Word. You can do it. You can read through His Word. I can read through His Word. And I understand that there are names in the Old Testament you can't pronounce. That's kind of fun. And for us who are older, you can suggest those names as names for your grandchildren and watch your children make funny faces when you say that. But you can do it. You can read from your Bible every single day. So, if I want my faith to grow and I want to get closer to God and be in unity with my brothers and sisters, then the new pattern I'm going to develop is being a daily Bible reader. Being a daily Bible reader. And when we look back at our text, the King James Version, or the New King James, uses this word, in unity to a perfect man. And this is reference not to perfection, but to be complete. And did you know that when we are together, we complete each other? That's the way God designed it. That's the way He designed it from the very beginning. God saw that man should not be alone, and he made him a helper. In Genesis chapter 2, beginning at verse 18 through 24. In the same manner, each person in the family, in the home, has a different function, and yet all of that builds one unit for success, doing things God's way. And so, every person has an important part in the function of the body of God. Christ. When we back up from our text to verses 11 and 12, here's what we read. And he gave of himself for some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ edify the body of Christ because we complete each other as we work together busy about the Father's business. When we go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 
Paul begins there at verse 13 comparing all of the, the physical parts of the body in such a way that we can understand that every person in the Lord's church is important. You are important. We need you. Did you know that? We need you. We need you. We need you. Every person is important. So, the third new pattern under the principle of unity is to be a completer. So, so I want to be an encourager. I want to be a daily Bible reader. I want to be a completer. None of those things are beyond your ability. I, I want to be these things so that I can be strong in the faith. Paul goes on to say, so that we are no longer like children tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness and of deceitful plotting or planning. You know, children in their innocence will chase the latest, newest, glitziest, most today's word relevant thing that they can find and, and oftentimes those things are, are are not very well tested and, and we're living in a world today that 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 is wandering away from from, from the word of God in such a way that they we're trying to dilute all of the language that, that we have and and we're finding that that the wanderings away of man are trying to be done in such a way that it becomes palatable for the believer in the Bible, so that so that we'll allow those things to just just go on by without without making mention of it. Well, I want to point something out to you. God did this, by the way. So God created man in His own image. Now watch this. He created him male and female. Created he them. God did that. The creator of the universe did that. And Jesus said this. He answered them and said, Have you not read? He who made them at the beginning, both male and female, said, For this reason shall a man leave his father and mother, and they shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. We can try to mix up all what we want here, but God did this and God said this, and that's the end of it. We need to be clear on these things. We need to be clear on these things indeed. And, and as, we, as we take our stand by knowing what God has to say, first of all, and believing what he said, and we're going to do those things which are right, inasmuch as we're going to do those very things, we're going to speak the truth in love. Verse 15 tells us, But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things unto him who is the head, Christ Jesus. I must say that we... We have been charged to speak the truth in love, not to compromise the truth. God said what He said. The words that we read are His. And as much as we, we can speak the truth in love, sometimes people will get upset. And maybe at us, but it's not the messenger, it's the message. That's why it's so important that we speak the truth in love. We speak it that way so that we can have this unity that we just talked about. And in this, in this principle here, what we're finding is, is that there's so many divisions. Why, why are there so many divisions? Jesus said, why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? You know what Jesus is saying to us here? He, he's saying that there are people who will plaster the name Christian all over themselves and they'll wear the, the catchy t-shirts and put the little fish stickers on the back of their car and, and all these kinds of things and still not do what Jesus asked of us to do. They will ignore all of His truth. They'll pick and choose. You know, I remember when I was a kid one time, 
we, my, my dad and I were traveling by ourselves, and we went to uh, a little hamburger joint. I don't remember what it was. But I remember this. I remember him asking me, do you want a cheeseburger? I said, well, sure. And so he ordered me a cheeseburger, and then I promptly, as I got it, went and peeled all the cheese off. And he said, well, why didn't, why are you doing that? Well, I, I wanted what I wanted, and, and so I wasn't going to eat all of it. You see, we kind of treat God that way. We'll, we'll take his word, and then there's some things in there that cause us some challenges, and maybe, maybe we'll try to peel those things out. If we are determined to be the people that God intends for us to be, we must learn to trust and obey Him. Jesus said that He is the way, the truth, and the life. And what else He told us was, if we love Him, we will keep His commandments. Those things we'll find in John chapter 14. Well, what would he have us to do? Well, we need to believe that he is the Son of God. John chapter 8, verse 24, if we want to be saved. And if we, we want to be saved, we need to be willing to repent of sin. And, and oftentimes that means we're going to have to really do some study on changing our priorities so that we can trust and obey him. So, so that's a repentance there in Luke 13, verse 3. And then he tells us that we need to confess him before others in Matthew 10 and verse 32, that we will do that before others and he'll confess them, us before the Father. And then he tells us that in order to have our sins washed away, we need to be baptized. Baptized. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Mark chapter 16 and verse 16. Jesus said if we want to be saved, then we must live a faithful life unto death in order to get that crown of life. Revelation chapter 2 and verse 10. There it is. The principle. Speak the truth, but speak in love. And learn a new pattern. A pattern of progress to trust and obey Him. And if we obey Him, you know that, that, that word obey gives with it the sense of, of having to do something. Working, being busy, a, 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 and getting, getting things done. And when we look at verse 16, we, we see this in our text. From whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes the growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. Notice here, the whole body is in motion. The whole body is in motion. Each part doing its job, doing what it can. Each part closely knit one to another. You know, years ago, a man taught me <clears throat> how to drive a tractor trailer, 18-wheeler, big truck, whatever you want to call it. And back in those days, <laughs> there were no such thing as automatics in those big trucks. You just didn't do that. And so what you, you learned to do was you had to change gears. You know, and some trucks had nine speeds. I learned on a nine, and then I drove a 13. And some trucks had 18 forward gears. Can you imagine shifting gears 18 forward times? You think we got, you know, we got a car with an automatic, it's got eight forward gears. Imagine 18 forward gears and having to shift every single one. And, you know, that's a lot of work. I mean, think about this. You got this clutch on the other side, and you're that clutch down every time, and you're shifting all those gears. So here's what you learn how to do. You learn to do something called floating the gears. And when you float the gears, this is how you do it. You listen to the engine very carefully. And then as the engine gets to just the right RPM, you slip it out of gear. You tap the accelerator, slip it into the next gear, and everything works in perfect sync. It's great. You know, if you've got 18 of those things to change, you don't want to be doing that all day long. So you learn to float those things. Now, I know i got a couple of drivers around here probably looking at me going like, now, you know you're not supposed to do that. I know you were not supposed to do that, but you learn to do that. 
but you learn to do it by getting the truck to be in perfect sync. And you see, <clears throat> if, if we're going to get to work in unity and, and, and all, all, putting all of these things together, we need to be in perfect sync. And we can shift and go as we go down the road and move together. But have you ever heard a truck go, ah, on the road? You ever heard that? The guy was shifting gears. I promise you, they never do that on purpose. <laughs> they don't do that on purpose. As a matter of fact, it's kind of embarrassing when, when, when somebody does do that. Uh, and, and so when, when that kind of thing occurs, the driver is working now. He's trying to figure out how to get that thing back in sync. Because he wants to keep moving with the load. He's not going to focus on how the gears ground. What he's going to do is figure out how to get it back in gear so he can keep moving. And inasmuch as we need to develop new patterns of, of being busy and getting to the work, we need to understand that when, when the load is heavy and we start working, that occasionally somebody or somewhere we're going to grind our gears. So when we have a heavy load, we need to apply more love. Apply more love. So, this morning as we've, we've looked at our text together, we've learned what we need to do in order to be saved, and we've learned a lot about being better Christians. Let's, let's take a moment and review. Progress principle number one that we find in this text is unity. Our new practice patterns are those of being an encourager, being a daily Bible reader, and being a completer. All those things we can do. And, and, and principle number two is to be strong in the faith. And we have to, have to be that daily Bible reader. We need to learn from God's Word and learn to be those who finally will trust and obey. Principle number three, speak the truth in love pattern is to trust and obey principle number four be a worker get busy new progress patterns are getting to work and when we have a heavy load apply more love so with all that we have learned together this morning i have no doubt that there is something that you have picked up along the way you know, one that you may need to become a Christian this very day. And if you're not a Christian, having been baptized for the remission of your sins, today is the day, and you can do that very thing. But if you are a Christian, and you have found that somewhere along the way, you stopped progressing, and you need to start adopting these new patterns today, Oh, there's nothing that we would rather do than pray with you and for you. Don't hesitate. Be God.